So I'm a researcher in human origins for the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. That means I'm a practitioner of bhakti yoga, the yoga of devotion, which partially explains why the bhakti club, bhakti yoga club here, invited me to speak. So my work and the history of archaeology is inspired by my studies in the ancient Sanskrit writings of India, which are collectively known as the Vedas. And among them, I'm particularly interested in the Puranas, which are the historical writings. <laughs> and some in the world of science today would say there is no room for such things in the world of science. You shouldn't mix science and religion or science and spirituality. That's a very prominent view. But there are people within the scientific world today who are interested in such things. And as a result of that, I've been invited to present some of my Vedic perspectives and on human origins at leading scientific institutions like the Royal Institution in London, uh, the Russian Academy of Science in Moscow, the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore, and many others. So the question I'm particularly dealing with tonight is how old is the human species? Today, the most common scientific answer to that question comes from the modern followers of Charles Darwin. And uh, they would say that the first humans like us appeared less than 200,000 years ago on this planet. And before that, there were no humans exactly like us on this planet. There were only various more primitive ape-like human ancestors. Now the Puranas, the historical writings of ancient India, give a different <coughs> account. They inform us that humans have existed for vast periods of time on this planet, going back many millions of years to the very beginnings of the history of life on Earth. Now, if I go to a, a meeting of the World Archaeological Congress or a meeting of the European Association of Archaeologists, in which I do, uh, I can't expect the archaeologists there to accept a statement from the Puranas as evidence of anything. It's just not part of the rules by which they <coughs> play their game. What I can do is this, and I do do this. I can make a prediction of the following nature. If what the Puranas say about human antiquity is true, then there should be reports of archaeological evidence for humans existing much further back in time than 200,000 years, perhaps going back many millions of years. So my method for testing this prediction was to examine all archaeological reports from the time of Darwin to the present. Now I divide the scientific literature into two basic categories, the primary and secondary scientific literature. By primary scientific literature, I mean reports by archaeologists, geologists, and other earth scientists published in their professional scientific journals. By secondary literature, I mean literature that is based on the primary literature, textbooks, survey studies, 
and things of that sort. So I did eight years of research using this methodology and my first finding, which is not so surprising, is that there are no reports of evidence for extreme human antiquity in the current secondary literature, such as textbooks. My second finding was perhaps a little more interesting. There are many reports of evidence for extreme human antiquity in the primary scientific literature, past and present. So I collected those reports of discoveries of human bones, human artifacts, human footprints going back, in some cases, many millions of years in this book, Forbidden Archaeology, which I co-authored with Richard Thompson, now deceased. The book was reviewed in most of the professional scientific journals that deal with human origins so that constitutes a kind of peer review. Now, as you might imagine, many of the reviews were negative, sometimes harshly so. But even I myself was surprised to find that among the reviews, even among the highly critical reviews, were some acknowledgments of positive aspects of the work. <clears throat> you know, for example, the historian David Olderoyd wrote a 28-page review article of, on forbidden archaeology in Social Studies of Science. And he's an historian of science dealing especially with questions like this. So he and his co-author asked, so has forbidden archaeology made any contribution to the literature on paleoanthropology? Our answer is a guarded yes for two reasons. Uh, first, they wrote, much of the historical material has not been scrutinized in such detail before. In other words, as a professional historian of science, he said, to his knowledge, in this area, he had seen very few works that went into the history of archaeology in such depth and detail. And second, he said, uh, the book raises, quote, a central problematic regarding the lack of certainty in scientific truth claims. In other words, scientists attach various levels of certainty to their theories and concepts. Some might have a very low level of certainty attached to them, or a very modest level of certainty. And sometimes uh, a scientific idea or theory will have a very high level of certainty attached to it, approaching absolute certainty. So he and his co-author thought we had done a good job in problematizing the level of certainty that scientists attach to their current views on human origins and antiquity. So after uh, my book Forbidden Archaeology came out, I began speaking about the subject matter of the book at major international scientific conferences. The first time I did that was in 1994 at a meeting of the World Archaeological Congress, uh, which was held in Delhi that year. Uh, the World Archaeological Congress holds a congress every four years, roughly, and it's held in a different part of the world each time. So I thought, well, this would be a good time and place to present some Vedic perspectives on human origins and antiquity. So I presented a paper at that conference called Puranic Time and the Archaeological Record. And I laid out how uh, the 
ancient spiritual culture of India had a cyclical concept of time and that it recorded a human presence during all these vast periods of cyclical time as described in the Puranas. And I also reviewed some of the archaeological evidence that's consistent with that idea. Uh, that paper was published in a peer-reviewed conference proceedings volume called Time and Archaeology, edited by archaeologist Tim Murray and published by Rutledge, a major scientific publisher. So sometimes people ask, do I have any publications, academic publications? And the answer is yes, I do have a few. Uh, after that first meeting of the World Archaeological Congress, I presented papers at many subsequent meetings of the World Archaeological Congress, and also many meetings of the European Association of Archaeologists, in addition to presenting lectures at various universities around the world. So, in my research, I did encounter many reports of archaeological evidence for extreme human antiquity in the primary scientific literature. So a question naturally arises, why is this evidence not in the secondary literature? Today's textbooks, for example. And I propose it's because of a process of knowledge filtration that operates in the world of science. And here I'm not talking about a conspiracy theory, a satanic conspiracy to suppress truth. I'm talking about something that philosophers of science and historians of science have understood for a long time. Namely, that theoretical preconceptions can sometimes influence how scientists react to different categories of evidence that come to their attention. So we can call the blue box up there the knowledge filter. What it represents is the dominant consensus in a discipline about a particular question. And reports of evidence that conform to a dominant consensus tend to pass through that filter very easily, whereas reports of evidence that radically contradict a dominant consensus tend to be filtered out, ignored, set aside, dismissed. And I thought it was interesting that uh, a prominent archaeologist recognized what we were talking about, that we were not talking about a crude conspiracy theory, as I'm sometimes accused of. Uh, Marilyn Patumati wrote in her review of Forbidden Archaeology in L'Anthropologie, one of the major archaeological journals, uh, Cremo and Thompson have written a provocative work that raises the problem of the influence of the dominant ideas of a time period on scientific <laughs> research. These ideas can compel the researchers to orient their analyses according to the conceptions that are permitted by the scientific community. <clears throat> So I thought it was nice that someone within the archaeological community recognized what we were, we were trying to do uh, in this book. So now I'm going to give a few examples of the kinds of archaeological evidence that I'm talking about. And some of the examples are going to be from uh, the earlier history of archaeology and some from the more recent history of archaeology. Some of the examples are going to be relatively close to what the dominant consensus will now allow, and some of the examples I'm giving are going to be quite distant from what the dominant consensus would now expect in terms of human antiquity. 
This is Virginia Steen McIntyre, an American geologist. She was involved in dating an archaeological site in Mexico called Huayatlaco, which is near the town of Puebla, central Mexico. There, in the 1960s, a team of American and Mexican archaeologists uncovered stone tools and weapons. And this is the excavation at Huayatlaco, which was conducted according to professional standards. The artifacts were photographed in the layers of rock in which they were found. And the archaeologists wanted to know how old these things were. So they brought a team of geologists to date the site. Virginia Steen McIntyre and her colleagues used four different methods to date the site. I'll mention a couple of them. In the same layer with the stone tools, animal bones with butchering marks on them were found. The geologists used the uranium series method to date those bones, and they got an age of about 245,000 years. Above the layer with the stone tools was a layer of volcanic ash. The geologists used the zircon fission track method to date that layer of ash. They got an age of 270,000 years. Using all four methods that they employed, the geologists concluded the site must be at least 250,000 years old. But the archaeologists re refused to accept this age for the site. According to their understanding, human beings capable of making those artifacts did not exist anywhere in the world 250,000 years ago, they had not evolved yet. What to speak of being present in North America? The current dominant consensus is that there were no humans in North America and South America before maybe 20 or at the most 25,000 years ago. So, the archaeologists refused to publish the age for the site, and Virginia Steen McIntyre and her colleagues decided to independently publish the age for the site <coughs> in the journal Quaternary Research. When they did that, they experienced an extreme negative backlash from their colleagues in the scientific world. And Virginia Steen McIntyre was a little bit surprised by that. Uh, she wrote, not being an anthropologist, I didn't realize how deeply woven into our thought the current theory of human evolution has become. Our work at Laco has been rejected by most archaeologists because it contradicts that theory, period. So I'm going to go back to uh, the earlier history of archaeology. This is one of the founders of modern archaeology, Jacques Boucher de Perret from France. In the 19th century, he discovered this anatomically modern human jawbone in an excavation of his at moulin Quignon near Abbeville in northeastern France. He found it in uh, this layer of his excavation, along with many stone tools and weapons. And according to modern geologists, that layer at Abbeville is about 430,000 years old. Belongs to the middle Pleistocene period. <clears throat> and even at the time of the discovery, it was quite controversial. Most scientists did not believe humans could have existed so far <clears throat> into the Pleistocene. <clears throat> so there was a lot of controversy about it, and some 
of the scientists involved in the controversy proposed an explanation. They said, most likely this is what happened. Somebody found a human jawbone in some Roman cemetery or medieval cemetery, and they brought it to the site, and they buried it there to deceive Jacques Boucher de Perc. <laughs> and actually, this is the explanation of this discovery that one encounters in today's textbooks. What we rarely see in today's textbooks is that after these accusations were made, uh, Boucher de Perc made additional excavations at Abbeville under conditions that completely ruled out the hoax hypothesis. And in these new excavations, he uncovered in the same formations 100 additional anatomically modern human bones and teeth. So I take this as evidence for an anatomically modern human presence going back over 400,000 years in Europe. I reported on this case and this paper presented at the 20th International Congress of History of Science. It was published. Now, coming back to more recent times, just last year, archaeologists made it an interesting discovery in the United Kingdom. On um, uh, the shore there, at a place called Happisburg, they encountered dozens of footprints in a formation that they estimated was between 780,000 and a million years old. The footprints were like those of modern human beings. Uh, for example, uh, the archaeologist involved in the study looked at the foot index, which is uh, determined by taking the width, dividing it by the length, and multiplying by 100. The average for the 152 Happysburg prints that were complete enough to measure uh, was 39. And the researchers pointed out this is very much the same as modern human populations, such as an average for a collection of Native American Indian footprints, uh, or foot width and length, of again about 39 and average for Eskimos, again, 38, almost 39. So the footprints were very much like those of modern human beings. Now, according to the dominant consensus, there were no anatomically modern human beings existing almost a million years ago in Europe. So uh, the, the way that modern researchers deal with this is, well, say, well, they must have belonged to the kind of ape man that lived in Europe uh, about a million years ago, homo antecessor, uh, they would call it. <laughs> but. If we just look at the evidence itself, they could just as well have been made by humans like us. In the early 20th century, an anatomically modern human skull cap was found in Buenos Aires. It was found in an excavation there. The excavation had gone down about 45 feet. At that level, they encountered a a layer of limestone rock, which they locally called Tusca. And then the human skull cap was found after they broke through the solid layer of limestone rock. The layer in which the skull was found belongs to the Preyan Sanatan formation, 
which according to modern geologists is about one and a half million years old. This discovery was reported to the scientific world in the primary scientific literature by Florentino Amagino, a prominent South American scientist. I reported on this case and some others in this paper presented at a meeting of the World Archaeological Congress that was held in Cape Town, South Africa. And you know, the, the reason I'm mentioning that is as follows. I'm trying to demonstrate that the kinds of things that I'm saying are part of the current discourse in these disciplines. Now, it's not a majority voice in the discipline. It's an extreme minority voice, but it is something that is being presented in scientific circles that is part of the discourse. A minority voice may even be a minority of one you know, at the present moment. <clears throat> now, many people are familiar with Ulduvai Gorge. Many important discoveries have been made there. But not very many people are aware of the first hominid discovery that was made at Ulduvai Gorge. And the early 20th century, a German scientist, Hans Reck, uncovered a fairly complete anatomically modern human skeleton at Ulduvai Gorge. And he found it in Upper Bed 2 of Ulduvai Gorge. And it was solidly embedded in the rock there. He had to take the skeleton out with hammer and chisel. And he said it was buried parallel to the bedding planes of the rock, which are tilted up there a little, as you can see. So according to modern geologists, bed two of Uduvai Gorge goes from about 1.7 million years ago to 1.15 million years old. So upper bed two would be towards the upper, more recent part of that range, but still well over a million years old. Of course, it was a very controversial discovery. There were decades of debate about this discovery through the 1920s, through the 1930s, through the 1940s, 50s. Many people thought the debate was finally settled in the 1960s when a German scientist named Reiner Proch did a radiocarbon date on a fragment of bone he said was from the original skeleton discovered by Reck. <laughs> he got an age of less than 10,000 years. So many thought, okay, that settles it. This thing is not a million or more years old. It's less than 10,000 years. Now, I have some problems with that resolution of the controversy. Uh, first problem was, Ruck's skeleton was lost during World War II. Uh, the museum that was being kept in was destroyed. So, where did Ruck, excuse me, where did Reiner approach get the fragment of bone that he used for the radiocarbon dating. He said, well, <clears throat> there, there was a box turned up that had a little, few little fragments of bone in it. And as far as I'm concerned, they're from Rex skeleton. Now, <clears throat> if I did that, <clears throat> many people in the mainstream scientific world would be very doubtful. But in any case, 
he used this fragment of bone, which may or may not have been from Rex skeleton, and he did his radiocarbon dating on it. But there's another problem with that. Uh, Reiner Proch resigned from his position at Frankfurt University after an academic committee there found him guilty of having forged and falsified dozens of radiocarbon dates during his long tenure there. So for me, such a radiocarbon date on a fragment of bone that may not have really been from the original discovery from Rex Skeleton does not resolve the controversy. I think the best evidence that we have about the true age of the skeleton is the original report by Rex that he found it solidly embedded in upper bed two of Olduroy Gorge. Another case from the primary scientific literature in the 19th century, Dr. Robert Collier reported a human jaw, an anatomically modern human jaw that came from 16 feet deep in the Red Crag Formation at a place called Foxhall in England. Foxhall is located on the outskirts of the town of Ipswich in eastern England, southeastern England. And according to modern geologists, the Red Crag formation there is, belongs to the late Pliocene period, which means it would be two to three million years old. <clears throat> In 1979, Mary Leakey announced the discovery of footprints at a place called Leitoli in the country of Tanzania in East Africa. The footprints were found in layers of solidified volcanic ash dated by the potassium argon method as being about 3,700,000 years old. In her original report, Mary Leakey said, the Leitoli footprints are indistinguishable from modern human footprints. Other scientists also agreed. Paleontologist Tim White said, make no mistake about it, they are like modern human footprints. Now, of course, neither Mary Leakey nor Tim White would say that humans like us made those footprints. So how do they explain them? Well, they proposed there must have been some sort of hominin, some sort of ape man who existed at that time who had feet exactly like modern human feet. It's an interesting proposal, but there's very little in the way of any skeletal scientific evidence that supports that idea. Archaeologists have the skeletons of the ape men, the hominins, who existed at that time in eastern Africa, They're called Australopithecus. And foot bones of Australopithecus have been discovered, uh, like in South Africa at the Stairfontein Caves. And from that foot bone evidence, it can be seen that the foot of Australopithecus was not exactly like that of a modern human being. It was more like that of a uh, kind of a chimpanzee called a bonobo. Long toes, sort of like short human fingers, a first toe that could move out to the side like a human thumb. Actually, the only creature known to science today from skeletal evidence that has a foot exactly like that of a modern human being is a human being like ourselves. So, what did Mary Leakey actually find? I think we have to keep our minds open to the possibility she found evidence for human beings like us existing almost for million 
years ago. So some might say, okay, footprints are a little bit ambiguous. It would be better if there were human skeletal remains from that same period of time. And such things have been reported in the primary scientific literature. Uh, for example, the Italian geologist Giuseppe Ragazzoni reported finding human skeletons at a place called Castanedolo in Italy in Pliocene formations about four million years old, according to modern geological understanding. I once went to the village of Castanello in northern Italy in the foothills of the Alps, and I met this gentleman there, and he gave me a copy of a very rare geological report about these discoveries. And from the information in the report, we were able to locate the place where the discoveries were made. Now, when many scientists today hear of a human skeleton found in layers of rock four million years old, they say, okay, this is very easy to explain. Obviously, here's what must have happened. Maybe 4,000 years ago, someone died on the surface here, and then they dug a grave, put the body into that ancient layer of rock, and that's why <laughs> you think you've got a human skeleton from 4 million years ago. Now, things like this can happen. They do happen. Technically, it's called intrusive burial. But Dr. Ragazzoni, being a professional geologist, was very much aware of this problem. And he said, if, it, if you study his original reports in the Italian language, which I did, uh, you'll find him saying, if it had been a burial, or the result of some earth movement or something like that, then the layers of rock above the skeleton would have been disturbed, as we see here. But he said he looked very carefully when he was taking the skeletons out of the ground, and he could see that all of the layers above the skeleton were intact and undisturbed. Actually, he said each layer had its own microstratification. You know, each layer was made up of actually hundreds of little thin layers that were all undisturbed. And that would indicate that the skeletons really do belong in the layer in which they were found, in this case, about four million years old. This is Carlos Ribeiro, who was the chief government geologist of Portugal in the latter part of the 19th century. He found hundreds of human artifacts in his country of Portugal. He found them in layers of rock that belonged to the Miocene period, the early Miocene period, which would be about 20 million years ago. And as a professional geologist, he said, there was no way these things could have come into those very ancient layers from any more higher, from any higher, more recent level. So he displayed the artifacts in the Museum of Geology in Lisbon with labels indicating an early Miocene age of about 20 million years. If you go to the museum today, you won't see them on display anymore. Uh, today they're kept locked in the cabinets behind me there. But I got permission from the director of the museum to study and photograph those artifacts. And these are some of the early Miocene human artifacts that Ribeiro had discovered. And I also went to the museum archives and I studied Ribeiro's original maps and field notes. And then I went into the countryside of Portugal and relocated some of the places where he made his discoveries. For example, this is the quarry at Morganiero. 
where he found human artifacts in early Miocene formations. This is one of them. It's a flint implement, a pointed flint implement with use marks on the tip there. It's interesting what happened. Uh, when Ribeiro was alive, he displayed these artifacts in the museum with labels showing a, an early Miocene age of about 20 million years. After he died, his colleagues in the museum did something interesting. They left the objects on display, but they wrote new labels for them. This is the new label they wrote for the artifact I just showed you. The second written line give, gives the uh, age, Paleolithico Superior. That means Upper Paleolithic Period. An archaeologist today believe that period in Europe goes back you know, about 20,000 years. So Ribeiro's colleagues thought 20 million years, that's clearly impossible. 20,000 years, that sounds better for artifacts like these. So they wrote new labels for all of the artifacts. And then the next generation of officials in the museum just put the entire collection away, new labels and all and was the first researcher to see these things in over 50 years. I presented a paper on these discoveries at a meeting of the European Association of Archaeologists that took place in Lisbon, Portugal in the year 2000. I thought that would be a good place to talk about it. And this paper was later published in a peer-reviewed Journal of Archaeology from Europe, the Journal of Iberian Archaeology, which deals specifically with discoveries made in Spain and Portugal. Sometimes people ask, do I have any peer-reviewed publications? And I, I do have a, one or two. A case that's always fascinated me is the California gold mine discoveries. Gold was discovered in California in the 19th century. Miners came to get it. And they dug tunnels into the sides of mountains, like Table Mountain, which is in Sonora, in the Sierra Nevada Mountains in central California. Deep inside the tunnels, in the solid rock, the miners found human bones and human artifacts. For example, they found many of these stone mortars and pestles. And what makes these discoveries so interesting to me is that they were found in layers of rock that belong to the early part of the geological period called the Eocene, which means they would be about 50 million years old. So this is how the dating was arrived at. The human bones and human artifacts were found in ancient river deposits. Um, those are those indentations towards the, the bottom there. And those ancient river channels are filled with layers of rock that contain plant and animal fossils characteristic of the early Eocene period. Those ancient river channels are covered with hundreds of feet of solid volcanic deposits that have been dated using the potassium argon method as being up to 33 million years old. And those solid volcanic layers seal off uh, the gold-bearing deposits and the ancient Eocene river channels in which these human bones and artifacts were found. These discoveries were reported to the scientific world by Dr. J. D. Whitney, who was the chief government geologist of California. His report, published in 1880, came out from the <clears throat> Harvard University's Museum of Comparative Zoology. 
but we don't hear very much about these discoveries today in the current textbooks because of the process of knowledge filtration that I've mentioned. This is the anthropologist William Holmes at the Smithsonian Institution. He, he said, if Dr. Whitney had understood the theory of human evolution, he wouldn't have come to those conclusions, despite the imposing array of testimony with which he was confronted. In other words, if the facts did not support the dominant consensus, the facts should be ignored, forgotten. And basically, that's what did happen. <clears throat> However, <clears throat> some years ago, I was a consultant for a television documentary called The Mysterious Origins of Man. <clears throat> it aired on NBC. The producer of that documentary had gotten a hold of a copy of my book, Forbidden Archaeology, and he wanted to use some of the cases from the book in the documentary. So I told him he should go to the Museum of Anthropology at the University of California at Berkeley because I knew that some of the artifacts from the California gold mines are still in the collection of that museum. So he did go there, but the museum officials would not allow him to see or photograph or film the artifacts. <laughs> we were, however, able to find photographs that Dr. Whitney had taken in the 19th century, so he did wind up with some visuals he could use in his documentary, uh, which featured not only examples from my work, but from the work of others involved in alternative perspectives on human origins and antiquity. When mainstream scientists found out that NBC was going to broadcast this documentary, they tried to stop NBC from doing it. Uh, they weren't successful, and afterwards, uh, this, these same scientists went to the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, and tried to get the FCC to investigate NBC, censure NBC, fine NBC millions of dollars. Now, I'm happy to say that the FCC didn't do any of these things, but I thought it was interesting that those kinds of attempts were made. <clears throat> After that, I went back to the museum myself, and I, what, what happened is this. I had proposed to do a paper on the California gold mine discoveries for a meeting of the World Archaeological Congress, and the proposal was accepted by the academic committee of the, of the Congress. So with that letter of acceptance in hand, I was able to go to the museum officials and they decided they, they would let me personally see the artifacts. They're not kept in the museum itself. They're kept in a storage uh, building several miles from the museum, but they are still there. And I also went into the mountains of California. This is Table Mountain, as it looks today and we were able to locate some of the old 19th century gold mining tunnels where these objects were originally discovered. Uh, this is the paper that I presented on these discoveries at the meeting of the World Archaeological Congress that was held in Washington, D.C. in 2003. Now, how far back in time can we go with evidence like this? In the year 1862, a scientific journal called The Geologist published an interesting report. A human skeleton was found 90 feet below the surface of the ground in Macoupin County in the state of Illinois. Above the skeleton, according to the report, was a thick layer of slate rock that was unbroken. It's an important detail. It kind of rules out the intrusive burial hypothesis. According to modern geologists, 
the age of the formation below the slate rock at that place is about 300 million years. This report from Scientific American tells of a beautiful metallic vase that was found 15 feet deep in solid rock near Boston. According to modern geological reports, the age of the formation there is about 600 million years. Now I could keep you here for many days going through one case after another because there are hundreds of them reported in the professional scientific literature from the 19th century all the way up to the present. But, you know, I'm not going to do that. I'll just point out that the implication of that evidence is that the current dominant consensus on human origins is most likely not valid. And this was recognized by one of the architects of the dominant consensus, uh, Dr. William W. Howells of Harvard University. When Forbidden Archaeology was first published, 1993, he read a copy of it and he wrote me a letter in which he said, uh, Forbidden Archaeology represents much careful effort in critically assembling published materials. I thought it was nice that he recognized that because the response of others in his profession was to say, this is just pure nonsense. <laughs> but uh, at least he recognized that part of the effort. And he went on to write, most of us in the world of science, <laughs> mistakenly or not, see human evolution with man emerging rather late. <laughs> To have modern human beings appearing a great deal earlier would be devastating to the whole theory of evolution. So, you know, I thought it was nice that he was recognizing the implications of the evidence if it were to be accepted as true. Most probably he didn't accept the evidence as true, but at least he understood the implications of it. Now, archaeologist Tim Murray had something interesting to say about forbidden archaeology in British Journal for the History of Science. He wrote, Forbidden archaeology, quote, provides the historian of archaeology with a useful compendium of case studies in the history and sociology of scientific knowledge which can be used to foster debate within archaeology about how to describe the epistemology of one's discipline. <clears throat> and that's exactly what we were trying to do in putting forbidden archaeology together. Foster debate within archaeology about the epistemology of the discipline. So epistemology is the branch of philosophy that deals with how we know things. What is evidence? What is truth? What, how are we to arrive at such things? So uh, that is what we were trying to do, uh, foster debate within archaeology about how to describe the epistemology of that discipline. Now, Murray went on to say, <clears throat> Forbidden archaeology is designed to demolish the case for biological and cultural evolution and to advance the cause of the Vedic alternative. I plead guilty as charged <laughs> in that indictment. <laughs> so, now it, it's at, at this point, it's at this point that, you know, seeing a word like Vedic, <coughs> that red flags and alarm bells will go off in the minds of many in the scientific world. Because according to how they see things, there has to be a strict separation between science and religion or science and spirituality. You can't mix them at all. Uh, there's no value in bringing in a Vedic perspective or any other spiritual or religious perspective. 
But I, I thought what Tim Murray went on to say was very interesting. He said, the quote, dominant paradigm has changed and is changing and practitioners openly debate issues which go right to the conceptual core of the discipline. Whether the Vedas have a role to play in this is up to the individual scientist's concern. Now I think that's a very enlightened position for someone who's a part of the mainstream scientific community to take. <clears throat> There's no ban on bringing in some perspective on archaeology that may have its roots in some spiritual or religious tradition. No ban. It's up to the individual scientist's concern whether or not they want to do something like that. So that is a position I can fully support. Now I'm going to end this talk by just recounting some of the experiences that I've had presenting this kind of thing to university audiences. I've, my books have now been translated into 25 languages. One of them is Russian. I've been invited to Russia several times. I've spoken at universities there from Vladivostok to St. Petersburg. And usually the lectures go fine. But at one place, there was a bit of a problem, the Cuman State University in Russia. Some professors there had invited me to speak and a lecture, sort of like this one, had been arranged. But some of the other faculty members at the university objected to my being allowed to speak at the university. So they began putting pressure on the university administration. And finally, the president or rector of the university, as he's called there, caved into the pressure and canceled the lecture. So the professors who invited me tried to get him to change his mind. He wouldn't. So then the professors who invited me went to the local branch of the Russian Academy of Science and they spoke to the director there and he said, okay, if they won't let him speak at the university, he can speak here. So they had buses bring students and professors from the university to the Russian Academy of Science building and the professors who invited me said, more people came than would have come if the, if the lecture had been held at the university. Because everybody was wondering, what is this man going to say that's so dangerous that the president canceled his lecture? And then afterwards, I had a nice private meeting with the director of the local branch of the Russian Academy of Science and with some of the scientists there who had wanted to hear me speak. Now, the next year, something interesting happened. I went back to the same university and I spoke at the biology department there, no problem. I guess they decided, better just let them talk <clears throat> and hope that the students who listen to him will on their own reject what he has to say. Make up their own minds about it, you know. And again, I think, that is the proper attitude. I'm going to leave it up to each one of you to decide what you think about what I've had to say this evening. If you want to pursue these ideas a little bit further, you could have a look at some of my books like Forbidden Archaeology, The Forbidden Archaeologist, if I didn't get forbidden once or twice a year, I'd have to change the titles of my books. It doesn't happen just in Russia. A few weeks ago, I gave a talk on forbidden archaeology at Google headquarters in Mountain View. They have a program where employees can invite authors you know, to speak at Google headquarters. So I was invited by some employees to speak. A lecture was scheduled. Some employees tried to get the lecture canceled. They didn't succeed in doing that.
But it's part of the territory. I know what I'm saying is very controversial. I know a lot of people aren't going to agree with me. I know there are even some who would prefer that I not be allowed to speak at a forum, in a university, or at some science-based company, or in any other forum. But I'm happy that I was allowed to speak here this evening, and I'm honored that so many of you decided of your own free will to come here and see what I have to say.